Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thanks for joining this special edition of the Florida Food Policy Council's Florida Food Forum, a one-of-a-kind event. It's hosted by the Policy Committee of the Council, and I am Del Deschamps, the acting chair of that committee. With us from the Council is the Council's administrator, Kendra Love. Kendra will be handling the technical and managerial aspects of our meeting. I'm also asking Kendra to let us all know when the session will close and give us an alert when we have five minutes left in the program. Kendra, do you have anything in general to uh, say to the folks that are calling in or logging in right now? Uh, yes, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, just a note, we are using Microsoft Teams, which is uh, a little bit different. It is very interactive, so it allows us to see and hear you. Uh, so we please ask that you keep yourself on mute and you keep your video turned off. Um, that way we're able to focus on the panelists. We will have some time later on uh, in the session to take questions. Um, if you do have a question, we do have a conversation uh, box. You can put in a question uh, at the bottom of your screen and uh, we will get to those questions at the end. Great. Thank you, Kendra. Our topic for this special edition of the forum is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Florida food system. In a way, COVID-19 is a participant that needs no introduction. It's a name that is quite well known in the state and in the nation. Its image is well known as well, that grayish globe with the little red florets coming out of it that seems to be on TV every night. We are all aware of this strange new visitor to our world, but we still don't know much about it. Our session today contextualizes COVID-19 pandemic relative to our food system. We may not know much about COVID-19, but we know how it is impacting our food system, this vital part of our culture. You'll find links to several articles about the pandemic and food on our website. Please consult that for additional information. And thanks as always for joining us. A document about our presenters for today is also posted on the council's website. And if you registered for the event, you have seen that. My introduction will be brief, so please take a look at the website for details on the talents and achievements of our guests. To get a better understanding of the impact of the pandemic on our, panel, our panelists, <laughs> we'll each represent a distinct part of the food system. Jamie Castoro will address the impact of the pandemic on growers. Jamie manages Dania Beach Patch, a market garden in Broward County. Nadia Clark addresses our topic from the standpoint of distribution in her role as Assistant Director for the Office of Family and Community Engagement in the Broward County Public School System. And to give a perspective on the pandemic's impact on markets, we welcome Jeff Wright, who together with his wife, Kathy, have operated Wright's Natural Market in Newport Ritchie for over 26 years. Welcome to you all. And welcome to all who are logging in or calling in today. We'll follow the sequence in which our panelists were introduced. Grower, distributor, marketer. Jamie, Nadia, and Jeff. Each will present for 10 minutes on our topic as it impacts their work. And then we'll open it up for questions from those that are calling in or logging in. Panelists are reminded to keep their presentations to 10 minutes. Kendra will facilitate the question session. Callers are asked to direct their questions to one of the presenters or to all of them to keep the questions brief and will ask our honored presenters to keep their answers as succinct as possible. And so with pleasure, we welcome our first presenter, Jamie Castoro. Jamie? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to share a uh, PowerPoint with you so that you can see what we do at the patch and how we've been impacted. Um, I'm not, I don't present a lot, so I bear with me if I, I'm a little uh, shaky at times. So, okay, I work with the Dania Beach patch. We're in Dania Beach, Florida. Um, we are a 
government supported uh, um, entity. Uh, these are our major supporters. We work closely with the USDA and um, to to help us with our marketing. So our vision is to strengthen the community, uh, increase access to healthy foods. We're located in a low access, low income area. We also have a, a, want to create a clean, safe environment and we grow and sell non GMO produce and we promote economic development. For, for locals so and then we um, were established in 2012 we are one of the largest and longest running market gardens in Broward County we are locally supported um, we're a local government supported agricultural network and uh, we provide lots of, we have lots of different activities and of course pre-covid we held weekly events we did yoga, we do uh, beekeeping workshops, art and craft days, and um, we s participate with the, the um, fast access box where people get 50% off. So we do lots of marketing in that area. And uh, pre-COVID, we also were starting mobile markets, which we were very excited about. And we had just got del a trailer delivered um, that was a gift from the Frederick DeLuca Foundation. So we were really starting to take off. And then post COVID, this is the effects. Um, we were closed for quite, for about two and a half weeks. Our markets were completely closed. The growers were here, but we were not, we were really uncertain about what was going to happen. Um, so we were growing minimally we're transitioning into our summer growing season and it um, was a little it's a little it's been a little bit tough we have pivoted ourselves um, and we are now selling a lot of nursery items and we're selling online not through a platform but through uh, we release our availability list people email their orders and we prep them and people pay online and uh, although for EBT and SNAP they have to come to the gate and we process. So um, we do a lot of education. You'll see in every bag we put in uh, safe food tips on how to wash your produce. We include the um, fast access box um, coupon so people can come back or share and uh, it's we are starting to get some legs with that. We've also uh, gone into a lot of donation of produce for to local organizations. We've been donating between 10 and 20 bags a week to to a variety of organizations directly in our community. And um, then we were also asked to provide some lessons. So the online ordering and processing allows us to spend more time growing, which is um, really valuable for us. And that is something that we may continue after this period is over uh, and then just keep the Saturday market for activities. Uh, we've also, there's a huge demand for locally grown produce and we need to find methods to engage and capture the customers that are, are searching. We need to let people know that we're here. And our nursery uh, should be developed to full potential so that we can sell seedlings and materials to people because a lot of people are um, asking for help on developing their own backyard gardens. And uh, even though we were down for a couple of weeks and because we do work with a government run organization, they really did pivot quickly to allow us to um, sell online. Uh, that was something that was really helpful. And we were fortunate in, in that they were able to do that because uh, we, we know that sometimes government and organizations work really slowly and there's a lot of red tape to, to get through, but they really helped us getting up and back to work. And um, the the like, the bottom here is that uh, we're living in, in a, mo a historical moment. And so the, the lessons that we learn can shape the food production and distribution landscape for a long time. So we really need to be thoughtful. And um, that that's it. So Thank you. And I don't think I took my full 10 minutes so somebody else can speak up or I guess if there's questions at the end. So, okay. 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 That's, 
That's great, Jamie. A wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, you didn't use the whole time, so that's great. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the other presenters can use all of that time. Okay. Hopefully, we'll okay. That time. Hopefully we'll use that time for questions and answers because that's what so okay. many folks are calling into the show about. So now we, welcome, now we welcome uh, Nadia Clark. So Nadia, tell us about uh, your wonderful project, your background, and how the pandemic has affected you. Okay, hi, thank you for including Broward Schools in this conversation. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint. Okay. Is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, I can see it. I think I think we all can see it. Okay, great. So again, my name is Nadia Clark. I'm with the Office of Family and Community Engagement. Um, Things moved really quickly in Broward, as I think it did across the nation. Um, we were able to pull together a task force. We've named ourselves Together for Broward, and we are a, a, a group of organizations, whether you're a county agency or a nonprofit, but we are all committed to supporting and sustaining our community during these extraordinary times. So I, I put together a timeline of um, our activities. So on March 13th, we officially closed our school, and we know that um, Broward is the, um, one of the, the seventh largest district in the nation, and that meant a lot of students would not have access to meals, breakfast and lunch. We also know that because our buildings are closed after school, and some of our officials do offer snack and supper, they too would not be able to offer those services. So on March 13th, we, um, began planning, well, how do we support our, our families? We had already positioned ourselves to provide food during the um, spring break, which was the following week. Um, so we knew that, okay, we're, we have something in place, but what do we do moving forward? Well, on March 15th, um, we began hearing from some of our community partners asking, hey, what are you doing with all the food that you had? So food rescue was the first one at the table. Uh, we shared with them, we are, we've are we already decided to um, redistribute the food and how we were going to handle um, our, our own resources. Um, we then said, but we know that there's such a great need, what else can we do? So we decided um, to host a meeting on the 17th for anyone in Broward who is involved in food distribution, whether, whether you're a, a donor, you are... Um, you are an actual distribution site, like a pantry, um, or homeless shelters, or if you had, if you're a funder and you wanted to see how could you be a part of this work. So out of that meeting, we came up with, well, our first action is we need to be able to get resources out to people and not have people jostle all around different websites or make 100 phone calls to find out where they can find food. So we decided we we're gonna create a, a single database of food resources across the county. Um, we have a wonderful partner in Anthony Olivieri from FHEB, and he had GIS mapping capability. So Broward Schools, as um, a, 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 an entity that we are, you know, we're not really into the community food distribution. That's not something that we typically do. I mean, we do have pantries, we do our lunch, but we know that at this point we are a community partner. Um, we also had resources on how to get information out to families. So Anthony created the map. We worked with a number of our partners um, to see exactly what information should be captured. Uh, as you can see on the 26th, um, we actually had this really great meeting and just created what was our mission statement, what was our first priority. So our first priority was, of course, food insecurity. And then on the 26th, um, Broward County itself as an entity, joined the task force, which provided us a bit more, um, a bit more information. Um, on March 30th, the map and webpage went live on Children's Services Council, um, but we also know that that is not the only place that we wanted this information shared. We wanted to make sure that people who were not connected with um, Children's Services knew that this was an opportunity. So the county, we made a decision to migrate the map over to the county, the county's website. And um, we were finally able to work everything out. And today is the day that our map has gone, has been published. We're live. Um, 
the great thing about migrating to the county system is that they have a full GIS um, mapping system that integrates with Waze. Um, it just increased the functionality of the map. Now, when we um, look at, this is what the map actually looks, at, looks like when you first um, log on to the county site. Now, our plan is to push, now that we're live, we're pushing this information out via multiple resources. So Broward Schools, using our communications team, we're letting families know, hey, if you're looking for a food distribution site, here's a resource. The county, they are pushing it out as well, as well as our partners who are um, at the table with us. So the beauty of the map is we can actually find a location based on your address. And if you're pulling this up on your cell phone, we can actually um, provide directions directly to the closest um, the closest distribution site um, based on where you are actually located. So how do we populate this map? We are using data from multiple sources. Uh, Broward Schools, we have opened up 51 food feeding sites where we're offering meals, student meals and adult meals for families as they're coming to pick up um, the meals for their children. Uh, feeding South Florida, which is our largest distributor and supports many pantries um, many organizations across the county, actually just across the state period. Um, so they have shared their list with us and South Florida Hunger Coalition. So those are three of the sources that we're using. Now, um, the map is maintained by my team and we are a mighty team of six. So I'm very happy that we found a way through the county system to quickly update um, as needed. And right now, I think we are, we're in a good place where we have a solid core group of um, distribution sites. And um, we actually have a system in place where we are looking now what is, what's coming next. So we know food. We're now moving into, as we continue to support the food needs, how else can we support our, our county? So that I don't think I didn't take my 10 minutes either. So I'm going to hand them right back to you. That, you know, this is uh, just an amazing moment here for us here at the Florida Food Forum <laughs> and that our <laughs> presenters are not, not taking their full amount of time. Well, th that was a, a terrific presentation, two great presentations. Uh, we're going to move um, north now uh, out of South Florida and up into the west coast of Florida and the city of Newport Ritchie. And our marketer, which is uh, Jeff Wright. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff now to tell us a little bit about, about his business and also about the impact of the pandemic on what he does. Jeff? Good morning. Thank you, Dell. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to be here and uh, allowing me to be on this forum. So my wife and I have had uh, Wright's Natural Market for 26 and a half years, and we've um, started with 840 square feet and we're now up to 3600 square feet we have a uh, we focus on local produce and organic produce grown locally we've got a cafe bulk foods bulk herbs packaged um, non-gmo and organic groceries as well as supplements so looking at what um we've incurred with uh, COVID-19. Um, so I would say I'm looking at this from um, just a perspective of observation on, on what we've observed with the different channels that, that interact with us directly and um, how we've handled it within ourselves. So first off, our goal as a community hub and gathering place was to try and keep as much normalcy in our operation as we possibly could. We really felt with the anxiety that people were feeling and the uncertainty of not knowing um, how this was communicated or, or passed from one person to another whether we should be wearing masks, whether we should be wearing gloves, distancing. With all that and the anxiety that we saw people coming in, we really wanted to keep as much normalcy as possible. So while we discontinued any workshops, 
because those are all in person. They're all really close together. So obviously we needed to discontinue those. We actually kept our farmer's market um, going. So because the farmer's market really focuses on local um, urban farmers in our area, we really just kind of pared back and the farmers that had enough um, enough harvest to really support the community um, in any kind of volume, we just spread them out and, and we just really asked our, our customers and the community to support them, but you know, practice social distancing and, and be polite and patient and, and wait your turn. And really um, only I think on a couple of occasions did we have to remind anybody of that. Outside of that, everybody's been wonderful, thoughtful, and patient for the most part. Um, the other things that we've seen, whether they were intended consequences from policy made or unintended consequences from policies that were made, we've seen supply chains um, stretched to the point where um, when we first had the state home orders, we were, um, we were getting about 30 to 40% of our grocery deliveries delivered. Um, so our shelves look like we were closing just like any other larger grocery store or big box store. We were all struggling, not just for water and toilet paper, but for for regular canned goods, dried beans. Um, believe it or not, um, produce, whether it be certified organic or locally grown, we really didn't have a lot of problems stocking which is a really wonderful thing because I think um, I think it was a, a blessing in disguise where it was an unintended consequence possibly, but our produce sales have really significantly gone up with the stay at home order. Instead of people just buying canned goods, we've had a lot of people buying fresh food and um, interacting with our certified nutritionists and our herbalists that we have on staff, learning more about how to eat healthier as a prevention, as, as a preventative way to stay healthy. So from a grocery point of view, we've really seen um, an uptick in customers really actually wanting to learn more and be more involved in making better food choices for themselves. Um, the, the direct manufacturers that we deal with from a food or a supplement point of view um, have continually um, had more problems with fill rates, what we call a fill rate, where when the pandemic kind of started, we were still getting 80 to 90 percent fill rates on our orders. We're now down right now. Um, to less than 50% on our fill rates because with natural products, obviously there's not six months sitting in a warehouse somewhere and to um, get raw materials, quarantine those raw materials, do identity testing, microbial, and bacterial and heavy metal testings on those raw materials before they enter into any kind of processing, whether that be a food or a supplement, really there's a really long lag time for to to catch back up to that. So those are the main things we've seen with um, COVID-19. Um, we also instituted um, curbside pickup for anybody who's immunocompromised or shipping it to their, their residents, even if they are local. Um, most everybody's been really good about the social distancing. And let's see, where am I in my notes? Um, So we still have issues with with supplements for immune support. I realize we're talking about food, but since we're a holistic approach, supplements do play a part. So zinc, vitamin C's, um, we're seeing anything elderberry, whether they're dried elderberries or already in a capsule or a syrup, those are all anything to do with immune response is really out of stock and, and out of issues. And we're also seeing where 
consumers or the general public are, are finally waking up to the notion of understanding where raw materials come from. Because when it comes to supplements, 80% of the raw materials come from China. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing or, or a good thing. It, it's just a fact of life and that's where it's coming from. If manufacturers are doing their due diligence and quarantining the product, doing identity testing, microbial heavy metal testing, and, and all that before they allow that to enter into the manufacturing process, I don't see that as a problem, except that we have this large dis disruption. And I think one of the unintended consequences, which I think will make everybody on the panel and probably everybody who's logged in to watch our webinar today actually more happy is that we see this need that sourcing of food and things need to be closer to home. So I think, you know, one of the questions they asked us to have in our presentation is how do we see policy impacting going forward or impacting how COVID happened? And, and as far as food chains and, and channels. And so I think really addressing a planning so that we include more agri hoods in, in our communities and in developments instead of golf courses would be a really great plus. Um, anytime we can have more urban farmers in our community, we we make our economy more resilient. We actually make our towns and that community that farming is happening in actually more economically strong and wealthy, as well as the food supply is safer, and as well as the enzyme activity or the nutritional value is more relevant for what's going on to help with digestion and help with allergies and help with what we really need for this area of Florida or South Florida or North Florida. Anytime we can get what's really growing locally. So I see a need for policies to be changed to help foster that. I'm not smart enough to know necessarily what those policies are that we need, but um, I certainly see where if they're either limiting some of um, our exporting of, of, of crops so that we have more crops locally, or whether we're inhibiting possibly crops from coming in and undercutting our local farmers or encouraging farmer growth where we have programs that help people to start a farm, either leasing the land, buying the land, or distribution. I, I see in Florida a real need for distribution channels that help focus on the small farmer. This is a problem I've talked with um, a couple of different panels over the last couple of years. One of them was the Florida Organic Growers Association. They had a panel in Gainesville and um, it was standing room only. And I'm not saying that because I did some wonderful job talking because I was horrible, but um, I think it's more of, of an illustration of all the farmers that are struggling, no matter what they're growing with, whether it's, it's crops or livestock, are having trouble with getting their product to the consumer. Okay, okay. That's, that's great. So, uh, Jeff, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in now. Thank you, Thank you. as our other or uh, a terrific uh, opening for our event today. And I appreciate Jeff, especially addressing the policy issues. We're going to open up the lines now for uh, calls as well as messages that may be coming in via text. And I also want to just um, put forward uh, two questions for us all to be thinking about, both the callers as well as our presenters. We may come back to these in a moment. Um, one is, is um, around the state, if folks are calling in, we are very interested in your firsthand experience of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on your own experience of getting food, whether you're going to markets, grocery stores, 
whether you are perhaps food insecure and getting it from a food bank, what has been your experience firsthand of this happening? And the other question that I have, and this is really for our three panelists also, is um, the uh, percent of the food that you are engaging with that is definitely coming from local sources. Uh, Jeff has spoken about that a little bit, and I'd be looking for Nadia and Jamie perhaps to weigh in on that as well. Final question that I have just out there, and I'll return to these at the end of the day, perhaps, at the end of our session, perhaps, is what has happened to the community gardens in your area? Jamie, I think you addressed that a little bit, uh, that it looked like the community gardens were shut down. Um, but I'm interested statewide in what local policy has been regarding community gardens. I have heard, I've heard anecdotally, that's okay. I've heard anecdotally that community gardens have been shut down by county or municipal requirements. Um, but that's just anecdotal. I've just heard reports from different parts of the state. That much being said, that's enough for me. Let's open it up to the lines and I'm gonna ask Kendra to go ahead and uh, come back on with us and uh, vet some of our calls or some of our contacts. Kendra? Thanks everyone. Um, great, great job by the panelists. Thank you so much for um, such wonderful information. We do have a, a question, our first question from Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie asked, I'm, or Jeannie said, I'm interested in how you have been doing outreach to ensure that low uh, incoming communities of color have access to food, both in a one-time offer of food and how ongoing food access for these communities is addressed. Okay, hi, I can, I can share what we're doing. Um, so we were really strategic in selecting the 51 sites for Broward schools. We were looking at um, areas where we have high concentration of um, pre and reduced lunch, um, as well as some other markers. So we ensured that those schools would be providing breakfast and lunch. We've also entered into a partnership with Feeding South Florida and starting on Monday, in addition to the meals that they're receiving, families are receiving, they'll also receive a food box. Um, the box should, is able to support a family of four for a week. So every week, those families will come in. In addition to getting the, the meals, they'll also get a food box. Um, what's really great about um, the connection of pantries that we have in Broward. Um, a lot of them are already located in areas where there is a high need. When the Lauderdale Manor, um, which is one of our schools um, and administrative sites, when that building closed, we were able to take the food that we would normally give out of that location and give it, um, redirect it to one of our community partners who is right in the middle of the 33311. So if you know Broward, that is a zip code. That's the highest need of pretty much everything. And families are receiving directly from those partners. That's great. I'd, I also want to note that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, panelists, each of you are working in what technically is a food desert, what technically is a USDA food desert. Is that not correct? Yes, I, that I, is correct I'm, for us. You're, reading your bios and knowing where you're coming from, I'm pretty sure that y'all are in food deserts. So you're kind of on the front line in a way, the tip of the spear of, of responding to this. Kendra, uh, and also I wanna note that the two folks, uh, Nadia and Jamie that did the PowerPoints, we're gonna have those PowerPoints up online. Is that correct, Kendra? Yes, yes, we will be posting uh, the webinar with all the information online after. Those were great PowerPoints. Um, uh, next up, Kendra, another question from uh, our audience. Uh, we have a question from Arlie. I would like to ask the panelists what their experience is in terms of the coordination of efforts to make these changes equitable, stronger, and more sustainable. I think that we're living through this now. And those are lessons that we will come, that we will maybe discuss after this emergency, no, I don't want to call it, it's kind of an emergency of getting food to the people. Um, I have not, Nadia, you spoke about the, the big meeting that you had at the very beginning, but I have not seen too much of that. I may be missing it because I'm working all the time, but uh, I would think that the, coordination or we may we might have a meeting 
after the fact. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody. So. Well, I can weigh in on coordination. Um, it was a, a real lesson learned, and we're still learning. Um, their organizations have their own systems, and they have their own way of doing doing business and you know getting food out. Um, so creating the Together for Broward was an opportunity to come together but respect the different systems um, that people have in place. Um, it, it takes a lot of coming to the table, coming to the table, coming to the table, and just building those relationships. Um, I think we are we're definitely much further along than we were back in March, but we also know that the field is changing. We know that we're seeing um, higher needs, we're seeing higher rates of um, positive COVID cases in some of our communities, so how do we support those communities knowing that families are, are um, quarantined? Um, but a lot of it is just, we came to the table as Broward Schools as I have this is not the lane that we traditionally run in, but we can provide coordination and support. So the goal is we're we have no we're not planning to become the lead food distributor for families. We know that the, our community has done an exceptional job at that. So how can we support? And I think just having that entity where there is um, no skin in the game as far as becoming a distributor, but having full access to a lot of families and children via our communication system. Um, has provided a, somewhat of a, um, just a, a, a safe platform for people to come together. Great. I'd like to thank that. Thank you, that. Jamie and Nadia. Um, Kendra, do we have a question for our uh, market uh, director, Jeff? If anyone uh, would like to unmute themselves, if you have a question for Jeff, um, if you are online, you have the uh, the unmute microphone button, or if you're on the phone, push star and six. Uh, we'd love to take a question for Jeff. I'm going to pose a question for I, Jeff. I, I, um, I I'm just going to take a, a, a moment on this, a kind of privilege of the chair. Uh, Jeff, you had spoken briefly about uh, your commitment to local growers and um, commented on the value of a robust local food system. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what you did as a market director, market owner, to actually engage the local growers in your project? Because I think folks around the state are very interested in that possibility. There's so many local growers, urban agriculturalists or uh, outlying farms, um, edge farms, uh, that really don't have a regular market. They may have a farmer's market, they may have stands, but you've actually extended the market itself. So I'm just curious if you could uh, maybe weigh in a little bit on that at this time, especially. Wow, that's um, that's a pretty robust question and I could probably take 30 minutes to answer it. Don't take the uh, 30 minutes, Jeff. Uh, so I'll try and be succinct and, and short. So we have focused on um, educating urban farmers, local farmers that, that um, need help with pricing because they're they're leaving money on the table at their farmers market port, part to say so they are struggling to understand how to price their product appropriately and then therefore they are not able to create a wholesale pricing where they're still making money and then able to reach either markets like mine or restaurants or other venues so we've extended our local farmer's market, which actually happens at the city library, by um, when they actually finish, they bring whatever, partly they bring what's left over. We buy that, we put it in our produce case, we help promote them, we help um, through social media acknowledge who those farmers are, that they are local, they are part of your community, and consumers are actually willing to pay um, a higher price point for locally grown produce over even certified organic produce that's grown somewhere else in Florida or outside of Florida. So we've certainly seen an enthusiastic support from, from the community. Um, we do talk to them, we do vet them, we want them, we're, we're encouraging them to grow organic 
using organic growing methods, because um, that's really all we're willing to put in our produce case and non-GMO crops. Um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We are wanting to help wor build more community gardens, more um, urban front yard um, growers. The, there's an ordinance in our community where um, you can grow edible produce in your front yard, your backyard. Um, we've got one farmer who um, is one of our main suppliers. He uses, I think, three front yards and he produces enough that he's making a very substantial income for his growing season. And, and I'm talking um, substantial. Um, he makes a good living. Um, outside of that, I would love to see more of that. We certainly want to be involved with um, schools teaching kids how to grow things because they're mesmerized when they see a seed come through the ground and grow into something that's green and or edible. It's amazing. Thank that's you. Great. Thanks, Jeff. All right, Kendra, next question uh, from the field or open up the mics for questions from the callers. We did have um, one question for Jeff, which is how can we help amplify uh, his and other similar voices to help folks see the story, the connection with local producers and the vision that you shared for a stronger, more resilient local food system? Um, that's an awesome question. And I'm not sure I, I know the answer um, but as an entrepreneur, I see an opportunity in everything that's happening. And, and I don't mean an, I, I don't mean an opportunity just to be profitable. I mean an opportunity to move the ball forward for communities. And with everybody having a lot of angst and concern about where their food is coming from all of a sudden, because they realize a lot of it was coming from China, we have this opportunity to educate people about why local food is important, how it does help them with um, nutrition and or the fact that they can grow their own in a little four by four section, whether they're in an apartment complex or somewhere else and they can feed themselves, make themselves more resilient, make their community more resilient. I outside of education at this moment i don't know what policies would be a great way to move that ball forward um i would say we need to have some some brainstorming on that with people who understand policy probably a little better than i but i think there's a great opportunity at this moment where people are more willing to listen to us so that we can educate them on how to do this or why this is important i That's think that great, moves the ball um, Kendra, next up. Uh, we had a question specifically about school buses. Delmarie asked, does anyone know why the schools don't use the school buses for food distribution to the most critical areas? So for, for Broward, um, it is something that we explored. It's something that we're still exploring. Um, that's not a department that I that I work with, um, but I can tell you that it is an ongoing conversation. Okay, great questions coming in. Kendra, any more? Callers? Um, we don't have any more questions in our chat box. Uh, if anyone would like to unmute and ask a question directly to our panelists, uh, you can unmute um, yourselves. If you're on the phone, you can push the star and number six and that'll unmute you. So you're able to ask a question directly. I, I, have, a, I, have, I have a question. I have seen the, I'm a teacher, an ESC teacher for Pasco County Schools. And I have seen produce being given out at certain schools each week. Um, and there is a big need there for distribution, giving to needing families, and I'm glad to see the school board doing that. Also, they're giving out lunches for families as well on Tuesdays if they pull up with their children. Um, so I'm glad of that. I, I am also very involved in churches, and my question is, how can churches be more plugged in and involved? Because I know there's a labor force there that can be tapped into helping needy families receive food that's available. Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, this is Jamie, ahead. and a few a few churches in our community have reached out to us, and we are providing bags to them on a, on a weekly basis to to hand out to uh, people that's part of their congregation that needs them. So uh, we we are engaging our churches, and in, in this community, churches are important, and and they're. We, we feel I, I feel fortunate that they have reached out to us because now we can possibly start some more um, conversation on how they can be how we can work together to get healthy food to these commu to, to communities all over um, South Broward. Yeah, Janet, I'm going to weigh in on this for just a moment. Um, there are a number of religious communities that are actively engaged in um, feeding operations, um, both prepared meals as well as distributions. I'm not going to specify any of the many that I know, but they, the religious communities cut across all denominational and all traditional lines, uh, churches, synagogues, mosques, ashrams, um, various different uh, religious communities are making that commitment. And I would say, since there's many people on the line right now, that it's really up to the individual leadership of the religious community to reach out to folks like Nadia or Jamie or, or Jeff or anyone that's active in the uh, existing distribution, production and distribution systems and just make the contact. Uh, also, it's very likely that if you have a local food policy council that that food policy council can assist in getting religious communities in contact with the food supplies. Thank you. Uh, Nadia, did you have any follow up on that? I think Nadia, on, you're on mute, Nadia. Okay. Um, a number of churches are also operating as pantries. Um, a lot of them have existing relationships with either Feeding South Florida or another distributor. So they just rolled into a social distancing giveaway, which meant, you know, just car full up and put it in the, in the trunk. Um, I do know of a number of churches who are putting together uh, boxes for the sick and shut-in. So knowing their congregants and doing home deliveries, leaving it on the doorstep. So it, there is definitely a way for our, our churches to get involved. And I would say one of the first steps is to reach out to a Feeding South Florida or some other entity um, in your community. Right. So we'll reiterate again the idea that it's the local religious community and the leadership of that community that makes a commitment to it. That could well be a part of a mission of any number of religious communities, that their mission to the community is to supply not just their spiritual needs, but also their material needs as well and their, their obviously their food needs. Okay. Um, Kendra, anything else or any other open lines coming in? Uh, we did have a question. If... Um anyone knows of any other similar programs in Sumter or Hernando counties? Well, I think uh, Jeff, Jeff Wright and I are the closest to Hernando County on, at least on the panel. Um, I am sure that there are systems in place in those counties. I just don't know about them. If one of the callers does, we sure would welcome that. Okay, so we, sorry, we don't have an, we don't have an answer to that. You might contact um, the extension office. That would be one possible contact. Very often the extension office will have contacts with uh, uh, individuals and groups that are sharing uh, food. That's not a guarantee, but maybe contact the extension office in, in Sumter County or in Hernando County. Okay, very good. Next up. Uh, we well, don't have any more. Oh, go ahead, Dalia. Well, I actually wanted to add something around the policy side. Um, there, There is a way we can amplify our voice, and there are systems that are already in place. Um, so one of the partners that we're um, working with is the Urban Health Partnership, where Food and sustainability is a piece of the long-term vision for healthy communities. So there is, we should look for those opportunities where we can lend our voice to a collective voice, knowing that 
food and health, they go hand in hand. How do we um, not exist in a silo, but really just pull our resources together and paint the best picture? We could also push on, um, we've actually been having these conversations um, with presenting to our county um, recommendations on having something in place that is, we wouldn't need to create another together for Broward. If there is another emergency, I mean, we're pretty much prepared for hurricanes. Okay, well, there we, we're, we quickly learn that there's other things other than hurricanes, but what else needs to be in place for to sustain our communities? And that's where we can have our gardens. You know, if it's part of the, the city mandate or the ordinance or whatever we want to call it, um, where within X number of square miles, there must be local gardens. Where we, we, we would then put ourselves in a better position to be sustainable and also knowing that we're having a deeper impact on not just food, but the actual health of a community. Uh, here, here, uh, a good point. There's a number of articles that are, that I'm running into that I'm seeing that are uh, including in them a recommendation for public policy, what can be done. Uh, and the point that you make, uh, uh, Nadia, is absolutely on, on point. Uh, we have so many community ordinances for greening and for using natural landscaping and controls on fertilizer and the like. There is absolutely no reason, if I can advocate for a moment, there's absolutely no reason why there could not be ordinances that would be developed that would require that we have a food shed in each neighborhood, that we use green space not just for uh, parks and other amenities, but actually for growing. These are steps that can be taken from a policy perspective. Um, I want to return then, since uh, the, it looks like the floor is open, I do want to return for a moment to a question that I had for everyone listening, and that's what has happened to the community gardens in your neighborhood, in your community? And uh, I don't see that anyone called in or, or uh, uh, logged in with a response to that. Uh, but just to follow up on the anecdotal reports that I've heard is that a number of counties and municipalities close their community gardens. They would not uh, allow the community gardeners to tend their plots. And as a result, in many communities, we lost uh, an entire season or at least the start of a season of growth. Does anyone have any other um, uh, information on that? And I think I'm looking specifically to Nadia and Jamie because you guys are working closely, I think, with some community gardeners. We did not close our community garden. Um, we were we were closed to the public for the market, but we have we have commercial growing space and we have community garden space. We sent a letter to our community gardeners inviting them to follow so social distancing and to, you know, to mind, mind their space. But um, a lot of those people are actually, are ordering from us every week and uh, picking up their food, going to their, their plot and harvesting their food and then coming and supplementing with us. So, um, and I'm, I'm seeing that other community gardens online that I'm, I'm Facebook friends with are, are operating down here. So I don't know that, uh, that is as widespread down here as it may be in other other um, areas, but definitely at the patch, our community gardeners are working and welcome. So, uh, which I'm glad to, to hear that because that's what we want to do is is encourage people to grow their own food. So, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that too. That's the first report I've actually had of 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 a part of the state in which there's uh, actually something positive happening with the community gardens because. Um, the social distancing, physical distancing was enforced differently around the state by different municipalities and local governments. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, I want to take a moment uh, and thank our presenters. I want to thank uh, J Jamie Castoro, Nadia Clark, and Jeff Wright for uh, truly outstanding presentations. Um, thank you all. Uh, Panel presentations don't always uh, go as effectively as this one did. I respect you all for the time, observing the time constraints, and also for the very good responses that we had to the questions as they came in. Uh, we do not do um, a special uh, 
food forms each month. We do them only when something important comes up, like a pandemic. <laughs> uh, our ordinary events, food forms, occur on the last Friday of each month. So please mark your calendar for that. And I do want to encourage everyone to please consider joining the Florida Food Policy Council. Membership dues are very minimal. It keeps you involved in what's happening in the Florida food system. It keeps you involved also with, in many instances, your local community and what's happening there, as well as regional and statewide issues. So please do consider that. And it also lets the Florida Food Policy Council keep doing things like this. Um, these are not cost-free endeavors that we are engaged in. So to the degree that you can see your way clear to share a little bit with the Florida Food Policy Council, it would be very greatly appreciated. And it will definitely go to a good cause and to a good end. That being said, as we look ahead to later in the month of May, I want to um, invite uh, Kendra to come on again for a moment and tell us a bit about our uh, food uh, forum that's going to occur on May, May 29th the uh, last Friday in the month. It's gonna deal with urban agriculture and I'm gonna turn this over to Kendra for a moment on that. Thank you, Dell. Thanks everyone again for being with us today. We will have another forum on urban um, agriculture and policy. That'll be on the last Friday of this month at the same time from 12 to one on May 29th. We are welcoming our guest panelist, James Jyler, and we hope to see you all here again. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you again to everyone that took time out of their busy day to be part of the Florida Food Forum. Thanks again to our uh, terrific panelists and thanks to everyone. And thank you to Kendra for her great work as always. We would not be able to do this without her. Uh, thanks to everyone and we appreciate your support of the Florida Food Policy Council. And so signing off for the special COVID-19 pandemic edition of the Florida of Food Forum. Uh, this is Del Deschamps. My best to everyone. Stay safe, stay strong. Thank you. Thank you.